What movie or series lit your fuse and made you have to tell stories on screen? Only Citizen Kane. I was not interested. I was working in live television around uh, 1960. And uh, I loved live television. I, w I lived in Chicago. I was born there. I was working at WGN television and uh, watching the shows from the networks like Playhouse 90 and Climax. And that's really what I wanted to do. I thought it was incredible. It was a, a miracle in your own home, you know, to uh, be able to watch these incredible dramas and comedies and musicals, whatever else. I had no interest in making films. I was not a film brat. I didn't go to film school. I barely graduated high school and had no intention of going to any other schools. And a friend of mine whose opinions I trusted highly said, there's a movie playing uh, near North at this, what was then called the Surf Theater, S-U-R-F. It was later, a number of years later, it was bought by Hugh Hefner and changed to the Playboy Theater. But I went to it when it was the surf and they were playing Citizen Kane. And this friend of mine said, you're gonna love this, I think. I didn't know what he was talking about. He didn't tell me too much about it. He said, you have to see this film. I went on a Saturday at about 11 o'clock and I saw Every show that day from 12 noon, I think the last show was at 10 p.m. I just stayed in the theater and I was stunned. I couldn't believe what I was watching or how it got there. Who did that and how? And I thought, this is astounding. So I went back the next day, which was a Sunday. I've now seen that film well over 200 times. I have got well, well over 200 times. And to me, it is, uh, it's the Holy Grail. It's the masterpiece of cinema. And it made me, if I was having a conversation with myself, it would be, this is what you want to do, but you'll never be able to do it. You'll never be able to do this. You don't have the... You don't have the knowledge, you don't have the mentality, you don't have the technique, uh, but that's what I aspired to. Because it seemed to embody all of the visual and audio arts in this one package. It was, I could say now, the best photographed film I'd ever seen, the best lit, the performances were outstanding. The story itself was mysterious and ambiguous. And uh, it didn't seem like there was going to be a solution. Uh, the sound was extraordinary. The sound was not anything I was used to seeing in a movie. At that time, the movies I would see were what kids would see. You know, Tom Mix, Roy Rogers, uh, you know, uh, kid stuff. And occasionally I'd mistakenly go into a real movie, but I never saw anything that embodied what I now call all of cinema so expertly, so perfectly. Uh, it told a story that was so deep and I and it was profound and I could I could say what it was about most films you can't tell me what the hell they're really trying to say no one else can either not even the filmmaker most films are just stupid stories and they plot along and then they end 
Citizen Kane was about the biblical notion, what shall it profit a man if, she, if he should gain the whole world but lose his own soul? And I felt that so many things that I had learned from the New Testament were embodied in that film in a fictional story. But it didn't seem like fiction. It felt like I had entered this person's life and gone back and forth with it, with it. And I was taken there by the people who knew him and who he interacted with and some of whom he loved and cared about. And it showed the change in his personality from an idealist to a pessimist to um, a, a, a rather profoundly uh, problematic human being. And uh, then came the ending, which was like a, a smack out of the sky. And I got it right away. When they showed that sled burning up, it hit me right between the eyes. And it made me think about the things in my own life that were going to resonate like that. As I came to try to enter the film world by making documentaries, and my first films were documentaries made in Chicago, um, I began to realize how extraordinary the technique of that film was. And I began to read about it. Who made it? How he happened to make it? With whom? Many years later, I was uh, president of the New York Directors Guild. And I was first vice president of the Directors Guild out here. And a member of the Motion Picture Academy. And Robert Wise was on both of them. Turned out that Robert Wise was the film editor of Citizen Kane. Uh, and his assistant was Mark Robeson, uh, another guy who became a great director. And I asked them many questions about it. Many questions, everything I could think of. And Robert Wise introduced me to Linwood Dunn, who had his own special effects studio, who did a couple of the special effects they used in the film. And Linwood Dunn showed me the printer that he used to make some of the shots in Citizen Kane. Looking back on it, Robert Wise always seemed to be a little bit shy in talking about it. Robert Wise was fairly, uh, he was fairly shy anyway. But whenever I would see him, I'd get him talking about Citizen Kane, and I could see he didn't want to. And years later, I learned that he also was the editor of Magnificent Ambersons, and they called upon him to make the changes they wanted at RKO without Wells' permission, and he made them. On your way up, what movie or series did you watch that was so good it made you question if you could ever rise to that level? Oh, there are any number of them. Treasure of Sierra Madre, All About Eve, 2001. Uh, before that, uh, Kubrick's Paths of Glory and The Killing. Those are films I still, I don't belong on that list anywhere. My, my name, and my film should not be mentioned in the same sentence with the films I just mentioned. And there were many others. H.G. Clouseau's Diabolique, God. Well, the musicals, the, the movies and mass that impressed me the most were the Hollywood musicals, specifically The Bandwagon and Singing in the Rain and Seven Brides for Seven Brothers. Those are the kind of films I wish I had been able to make, but they were gone by the time I got to Hollywood. There was no Gene Kelly, no Fred Astaire, no, uh, no Vincent Minnelli, Stanley Donnan, 
all the masters of the musicals. But I still watch them. Whether it was your own work or approval from someone who mattered to you, what first gave you the confidence that you belonged? I don't belong. I don't belong on that list. My film should not be mentioned in the same sentence with any of them, no matter what anybody says. You could tell me, you know, Sherry, my wife, often says, my God, The Exorcist ranks with Citizen Kane. And I look at her and I think, honey, you, we're married. You don't have to say that. They should not be mentioned in the same sentence. They don't belong in the same universe or with the treasure of the Sierra Madre or All About Eve. Those are masterpieces. I have not made a masterpiece. I'd love to someday, but no. The film that I admire the most that I directed is Sorcerer. That's the film that, if I'm remembered at all, that's the one I hope I'll be remembered for. I think it's pretty effective. And I get a lot of email and calls and letters from people all over the world, and it continues to play mostly about Sorcerer. Not about The Exorcist or The French Connection or To Live and Die in L.A. I get a lot of mail about some of that stuff, too. And emails from people I don't know. But the film that I can still watch of mine is Sorcerer. Steve McQueen, we wrote the script, Wally Green and I, for Steve McQueen. We talked to him about it. He said, great. We sent him the script. He said, this is the best script I've ever read. He said, now let me tell you my situation. I just married Ali McGraw, which we knew. And he said, I don't want to leave her and go into the jungle with you for the next 10 months. So he said, why don't you write a part in it for her? I said, Steve, you just said it was the best script you've ever read. There are really no important roles for women in it. I'd have to rewrite the whole script. And he said, okay, uh, make her an executive producer. And I was arrogant as hell in those days. And I said, Steve, I don't believe in that. That's bullshit. There are no executive producers. That's just a a phony credit and I'm not gonna I knew Allie and I like her and I'm not gonna embarrass her with something like that or you and he said all right he gave me a third opportunity choice he said make the whole film in America make it somewhere in this country where she can come and be with me and I said, I already have the locations. I had already told them where I wanted to shoot. I said, I love these locations and I'm, I don't want to change them. I was an idiot. Um, I did not realize what I know now, which I've probably said to you before. A close up of Steve McQueen is worth the greatest landscape shot you could ever make. And I didn't know that. I thought I was the star. And wherever I pointed the camera is where people wanted to be. What was the biggest obstacle you overcame that allowed you to turn the projects that influenced you into your own language? Talent. I didn't have... My ambition exceeded my talent. I did the best I could, and in a few cases, I think it worked out okay. Sorcerer is okay. The French Connection, for what it is, is okay. Uh, the Exorcist, God, tens, hundreds of millions of people have seen it and continue to see it and are moved by it. Um, so I guess they turned out pretty well, uh, as did a couple of others. But uh, 
Sorcerer is, is the only film of mine that I can still watch. It was dangerous. People could have died. You could never do that today under the new guidelines of filmmaking. I couldn't make most of Sorcerer today the way I made it. And there were no special effects. We, we just shot what we saw and staged. So many people who write on the internet regard Source, uh, uh, French Connection as the greatest chase going. And in the top five is usually to live and die in LA, which I think is better. The fortunate thing for me was I, I had not seen the Buster Keaton chase scenes before I made either of those films, or I would never have undertaken a chase scene. Those things are, you want to talk about death defying and brilliance and incredible staging, all of which endangered human life, especially Keaton's. And he wrote those chases, he directed them, and he performed in them, he starred in them. Uh, had I seen any of those, it would be like the reason I have never put a paintbrush to canvas because I've seen all 36 Vermeers and I've seen the paintings of Vincent van Gogh and Rembrandt's portraits. So what am I going to do? What keeps you optimistic that this industry will be able to rebound? I don't know how they're going to be able to make films the way they've been made. How do you do a love scene? with masks, two people wearing a mask, and I, I, I just don't know. And supposedly there's guidance from the mayor and the governor on what to do on a film set. What do they know about what to do on a film set? Look, there are things you can do. You can do concerts without an audience in the room. You can do sports without people in the stadium. Uh, there's a lot of it, but acting, you, you can't do that on Zoom. Although I think there, there's some attempts being made at stuff like that. But I, I'm not that anxious to see them.